We're here at the Meaning Code today with Stephanie Lamb, an award-winning artist from California. And uh, I'm really excited to hear more from Stephanie about her life journey, her art journey, and uh, let's get started, Stephanie. Hi, Karen. I'm so glad to be on your show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm really excited about this. I, I love your picture wall back there. I see all those dogs that I have met and your horse. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I um, started a podcast on pet loss. And so I thought it would be helpful if I ever made it video at some point to have like a suitable background. But in the meantime, it just looks good for calls and stuff. Well, you could do your podcast with podcast and YouTube at the same time, you know. That I, I've actually been thinking about that. So yes, I believe at one point over lunch, you were encouraging me to, to do video at some point. So all your ideas have worked out very well for me. So I'm like, I need to listen to Karen more. Well, so one of the ways I always like to start with people when they visit my channel is to tell me about your life, your background, about growing up. You grew up in California, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm Bay Area, born and raised. Um, most of, well, all of my immediate family is here. Most of my extended family is here too. Uh, my dad's Chinese, my mom's Caucasian, and they met and married very young, like 18. They met when they were 15. Um, and it's just me and my brother. I have a brother that's about eight years younger. And um, yeah, I grew up in this area, but was very privileged in that I got to travel a lot. Um, so that was a huge, not only eye-opener for me as a person, but since we're talking about art today, I think really helped me develop as an artist and get a taste for, you know, seeing other art, other architecture, other cultures. Um, and yeah, I went, I even went to school locally. So I went to Santa Clara uh, twice. <laughs> I was an English major and then I went for my MBA and um, didn't really get into art. I mean, I was always a creative kid, like everything from jewelry making and quilting and painting and drawing and I was always the kid with a sketchbook or a book but um, didn't really start taking it seriously until right as I was leaving college <laughs> so undergraduate needed to fulfill my fine art requirement took a painting class and was like how did I miss this for four years and so that was I think I, I kind of treat that as sort of the beginning of my creative journey in terms of more seriously wanting to learn about art, learn about the principles of design, that kind of stuff. Um, so could we just step back a little bit to your childhood again? Sure. <laughs> so you grew up, your dad was Chinese and your mom was Caucasian. Mm -hmm. and, um, and would you mind talking at all about whether or not in your family that you, you had any sort of uh, faith in your family, any church experience or anything like that? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I grew up, uh, I was raised as a Christian. We went to church, maybe not as often as we ought to have, uh, but my grandmother was actually an evangelist. So she uh, suffered tremendously under communist China um, in the 50s and was actually like in a concentration camp and managed to flee to Hong Kong and then came over to the United States when my dad was about seven. Um, so she ended up after working various jobs really feeling led to preach and speak about her journey and what God had done for her life. Um, so she basically turned it into a ministry and was doing tours to China and speaking around the United States quite a bit about her experience. Um, and that was, had a big impact on my childhood in terms of not only being connected to her and the work that she did, um, but just kind of growing up in a climate of like, this is who we are, this is what we believe. My mother similarly um, grew up in church and my parents actually met on an airplane on the way to a mission trip, um, so that's been that's been a big part, I would say, of of my upbringing was being aware of who Jesus was, um, you know, being part of a church to an extent, um, 
you know, having Bibles around the house and talking about scripture, but not to say that we were um, like doing a lot of biblically oriented activities as a family. I mean, we, we didn't really do Bible studies and things. It wasn't until maybe I was about 18 that I really committed my, my faith in my life and wanted to have a relationship with Jesus. But I definitely think that growing up in that environment exposed me to a lot of those ideas and other people that were living that way. Did you, did you have a time after that where you struggled at all with um, the commitment you had made? Or I would say most of my teens was a real wrestle. I've actually was processing this with my therapist a few weeks ago and kind of saying like, I never felt like in terms of coming to faith and getting to know Jesus, that it was this um, honeymoon experience, I guess. I hear a lot of, it's a very popular narrative, I feel like, in Christianity and the church today that, you know, there's the before Jesus and after Jesus, and um, people talk about just having I think a very emotional experience around it that was a a big light switch on and off, right? Life was bad, life was good. Or I felt the comfort of God immediately. And I I would say most of the critical years where I was kind of making that decision and coming to terms with, you know, my faith, uh, I, I had a lot of personal struggle. I had a lot of depression and anxiety that I was dealing with. I had gone through um, some pretty significant traumas as a teen. Um, and so for me, I have been reflecting with my therapist, the conversation we were having was that like, I never really felt like God was this all embracing, um, you know, security blanket in the times that I look, looking back, I think I most needed him. And so I, I did spend some time kind of going, you know, where was God during that period? Um, and she, she actually had an interesting response because she's known me for like 15 years now. So I would say she knows me pretty well. And her take was actually that just for who I am and my personality, um, she actually thinks that the way God chose to, um, take care of me in that time and be connected to me worked to my advantage in the sense that, um, because I was so exposed to a lot of people that were involved in ministry and I was sort of in it that way, um, I think it was really important that my faith was mine and that it was a choice that I was making and that it wasn't reliant necessarily on what I was told my experience of faith should be, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, and I don't know that I'm fleshing this out super well, but, uh, I definitely, to answer your question, have had um, some crises of, of faith. And I would say the, the most significant one has been in that period of, you know, being probably 12 until about 18, where I was just really wrestling with a lot of personal, psychological, emotional. And those years are just hard, I think, for most people anyway. Um, and then... I got really involved in church and really started learning more about God and being excited about that relationship. And God used worship for me as a huge connecting point. I was involved in a gospel choir um, at my church. And that was, to this day, is still an experience uh, spiritually and creatively that I've never found again anywhere else. And I've actually met with other people that were serving at the same time I was. We've had kind of reunions and we've all kind of felt the same way. Like God did something really special with, with this group at this church at this time. Um, but I really feel like for me, he used that period of time to, um, I guess, maybe give me some of that emotional honeymoon experience where I could just really experience the high, so to speak, of being excited and passionate and in awe um, in a way that lasted, I feel like, for a long time. But I would say that the, the way that I was living, I was still making a lot of really stupid choices. Um, and that was, I think, a good part of my 20s. I was interested in God. I cared about God. I wanted to serve God. But I would say 
there were big parts of my life that weren't lining up with what I professed to believe. And it was a long process, <clears throat> excuse me, a long process of getting my actions to align with um, my professions of faith in different ways. So, yeah. Well, thank you for <laughs> open about that. I have a, a similar experience in a choir. When I first moved to California, um, you know a lot of my story, but when I first moved to California, I had just gone through like a really traumatic season. And uh, I didn't know a soul here, but I got involved in a choir that was just a remarkable experience at a church. And it was more than a choir, it was a family. You know, and and that was really how I put down roots here. And and you're absolutely right about that feeling of being able to be in a unit as a body working together, and everybody has their own part, and yet it all comes together in this magnificent experience of praise and worship. It's, it was it was a wonderful experience, and I really miss it. But there's never been you know, I tried another choir after that and it just was never the same. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I didn't know that you were a singer. How, how interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gosh, we've never had that conversation. You're a singer. Yeah. No, it was, it was I'm a soprano. For the, for the audience to know how it was that you and I met, because there's big difference in our ages, big difference, probably at least 40 years, maybe almost 40 years. Yeah, I um, I very lovingly cyber stalked you. <laughs> uh, no, I, I I believe it was actually the same therapist that knew of your work through another client, and she told me about your work. She's like, go check out this artist, and I googled you, and I found your website, and um, completely just emailed you out of the blue, and told you how much I enjoyed your work and wanted to connect with you, and you very generously. I think through a few back and forths, we, we did end up getting to a place where we got to meet. And uh, that's, that's at least how I remember it. But my memory's not always the best. Do you remember something different? No, oh, no, that's it. I mean, I remember sitting at my kitchen counter with you and having a conversation. And uh, I have to say, you've been kind of transformative in my life because I've, over the years that I've known you, I've sat back and just watched you soar like an eagle i mean every part of your life is amazing to me you've you've grown as an artist you became a bodybuilder <laughs> that's right you were with the, me in the bodybuilding stage yes <laughs> i mean and everything you take on you take on with such zeal and enthusiasm and um commitment i guess and that's always been a huge area of weakness for me because i'm i'm very much an idea person i could sit and come up with ideas all day long i could sit and do this talk thing all day long but to actually live what i say is a constant challenge for me to actually live out what i believe and uh, i have to remind myself minute by minute that i you know i can't just talk i have to do and it doesn't come naturally to me at all. But when I watch you, it just seems to it just seems to pour out of you that you live your talk. And uh, I greatly admire you. I'm so glad you're recording this because I'm going to go look at it when I'm having bad days, which lately seems to be every day. Thank you so much. That's like the nicest thing you could have ever said. Um, I so now we're going to have this mutual admiration society because I feel like I've learned so much from you and you've been so life changing for me in terms of being exposed to someone who thinks the way that you think and I think modeling too as a woman what it means to have an enormous brain and to not back away from that when you're presenting yourself to the world I greatly admire that about you and feel like we need a lot of that in the world and so I feel very honored to be connected to you personally and be able to say yes like you model that for me um and then just everything you've done with your artwork has just wowed me and and i know you've talked about this on the channel before how your your working method is to you know take chaos and create order and i i'm always in awe of how you do it for one 
and it's been transformative for me. And this is where I think like God's brought us together in, in a complimentary way, at least it's, it seems like, because I'm, I'm always coming to my creative space, trying to control it. And I feel like you have managed to embrace that you're not going to control it. You can't control it, but you're, you're going to find a way to make beauty out of it, out of what is in front of you. And it's a, it's a humble and intuitive way of working that I feel like part of why God has you in my life is like, you need to learn these things. <laughs> so, well, don't, don't go too far that direction because I, you know, full confession, part of the reason I work the way that I do is that I cannot work the way that you do. And so I look at your work and I think I would love to do that, but I don't have the discipline to develop that level of skill. And so with the level of skill that I have, I have found a way to work that still produces a level of beauty that makes me feel good, but I don't have the discipline that you have, you know? So I, I do think it's, it's wonderful to see the way that you've worked a little bit of chaos into your work, you know, the way that you've explored color and explored edges and, and all of those things that gives your work a great amount of life. It just like, comes off the canvas, which I think is just grand. But don't give up on that amazing skill that you have to produce um, classic work because uh, maybe, you know, I, I wanna talk a little bit more, but before we talk a little bit more, maybe it'd be nice to just show people some of your work. <clears throat> I can do that. Yeah. You, uh, share my screen. Well, can, before you do that, can you okay. open up the a couple of the dog pictures? The uh, the you know the dog clown and the yeah 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 so those are going uh, back like what ten years maybe going oh the dog clowns you don't have you to know what you I don't a know picture from your show at the museum yeah I the clown ones I don't think I can find very readily I I no, use Dropbox and it's greatest. organized but it's not the greatest so at least I'm not the greatest about organizing it let me I'll I start off. No, Stephanie, on your share screen, you had a picture of the dog from um, your French bulldog. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this, so this is what I started off doing. Actually, was just, just more straight pet portraits. And then when I had that show a few years ago, I moved into trying to tell a little bit more of a story. Yes. Um, well, and I'm a big story. Could you tell the story? What, what was behind this painting? Yeah, so this one's entitled The Martyr. And um, the, the connection that I'm hoping viewers will make is with William Tell and shooting the apple over, I don't know if it was his son's head or a boy's head, um, but high stakes. And the slightly off color observation that I'm hoping viewers will make is that there are quite a number of <laughs> shots that are not on the mark. Uh, this this is a wide range of targets here that there's holes all over the place. And so for me, this painting was really about, um, you know, the idea that we all sacrifice and spend ourselves for something um, that, you know, as much as I, I tend to be a, a cautious person that likes to really think things through to the point of overthinking and overanalyzing. And part of that is because I'm afraid to engage. You know, I want to, I want to come in at a level where I won't embarrass myself or I want to come in at a point that's most advantageous. It's, it's kind of trying to control the process a little bit, right? And, you know, at one point I realized that, you know, as much as I think that I'm preserving or holding back in a advantageous way the reality is is we're still constantly spending and using ourselves our time our talents our emotions all day every day and so being really thoughtful about how are we doing that um what are we you know on a grander scale sacrificing our lives for and in this case you know it's it's a heavy subject but i feel like you know french bulldogs are cute and funny and bring a little levity to the subject. And so she's, this is actually my brother's dog. And she is standing in front of a target. 
theoretically before a shooter that may or may not be all that skilled. <laughs> asking, asking him or her to hopefully aim and hit the apple. And so, you know, the idea was just to kind of illustrate, you know, that ask this question of what are we, what are we sacrificing our lives for? So that one's called the martyr. Um, the overachiever. This was actually my chihuahua that passed last year. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I've got, we've got four dogs in the house and three of them are seniors. So it's been a lot of that the last couple of years. Um, but she, people always ask me, oh my gosh, did, did you really put all those chains on that little dog? Well, no, uh, it's the beauty of Photoshop. And then I worked from the, the composited image, but the overachiever basically kind of speaks to the idea that, you know, we, by, by being sort of these type A overachieving personalities, especially in Silicon Valley, we get a lot of props for it. There's a lot of pride in it, um, but it's actually um, a prison of our own making in a lot of ways. Uh, and I and I feel like it's it's something that when I was a student I struggled with this as a professional person I struggle with this as a creative person I struggle with this um, and for me oops for me seeing seeing the situation outside of myself like I can have compassion on on a little dog it's a lot harder to have compassion on myself as a flawed human being. And I think actually to tie in Peterson, which I told you I wasn't sure I'd be able to do, I was actually reading a little bit of that in his book where he was, I think it was the, the chapter in 12 Rules for Life that he talks about, you know, take care of yourself as if you were someone responsible for helping. I think that's the chapter. And he kind of delves into this, this idea of self-care in a, in a really beautiful way. Um, so, yeah, so that's the overachiever. And then I think the last one I have up here is the pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I love to have fun with the, the animals juxtaposed with more human objects. But yeah, so this tell me, is... Tell me about the crown. I get, I get the chop, but chopping block, but I don't get the crown. Yeah, so... The crown for me ties into this idea that as, as children of God, we are dearly loved um, and we are royalty, right? And how sad it is that we would be spending our time obsessing over a chopping block and a cleaver, in essence. So hence, hence the royal pig. I, I, yeah. It's an extended metaphor that has its limits, but the idea that, you know, I don't know, I, I think of myself sometimes as the silliest of barn animals when I think of my, my shortcomings and my anxiety and my nearsightedness in the context of God's infinite vision and wisdom and love. And uh, it's sort of a self-deprecating I guess, use of farm animals as people. But so the, the crown is meant to just highlight the fact that despite all that, we are still chosen. Well, okay, let's go back to our, our regular screen, just you and me, so we can talk a little bit about, yeah. about this part of your journey. So you started working on art right towards the end of your college career, you said, mm -hmm. at the end of undergraduate? Mm-hmm. Yes, it was about... 20, 21, 22. And were you mostly doing pet portraits at that time to earn money? Is that? Yeah, I started doing it just because that's what I cared about painting. Um, and I was taking, I was doing a lot of workshops too. And so of course in workshops, you're doing all kinds of different things, right? But I would say that was my primary subject. And then yes, it did kind of turn into sort of a, a side business that helped me grow my my skill set mm -hmm. yeah and would there be any particular artist or style that you think helped you grow the most or helped you on your journey mm. 
You said you took a lot of workshops. Yeah. Well, in terms of like actual teachers, I'm right. You're talking about, yeah, uh, Bob Burridge. And I know we've had conversations about him. Um, he's very, I think, well known in sort of the workshop, artist workshop retreat um, world. And I'll link to his YouTube channel. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would be great. So people That's can a lot see. Of really nice little mini lessons for people. Awesome. I know when I know the kinds of workshops that you went to with him though were substantially more in depth than the kind of thing he does on his YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah. I I did a couple that were three and four. I think one of them might have been five day workshops. And I think the thing that I really needed at that point in my development was someone who was encouraging and positive and experimental. Um, I think initially, you know, when we start any kind of discipline, it helps to go wide just to kind of get your bearings and figure out what it is that you like. And at least that's always worked well for me before kind of narrowing down into a specific niche. And he really offered that. He was very much like, nothing is precious, you know, burn through as many things, try as many things. You know, if you're questioning, the answer is yes. You know, should I do this? Should I try that? Yes. You know, and I needed that. I, you know, one, I had a, like a weekend workshop from him one time when he came up to our art group and did a workshop. And the main thing I remember from that is he handed out to everybody a little slip of paper that, that was a permission slip. <laughs> yes. <laughs> here's your permission to fail. Here's your permission to try. Here's your permission to experiment. You know, uh -huh. your permission slip. But, yes. Yeah. yeah. He, he has a really, I think, good knack, at least in his workshops, for providing enough structure that you don't feel like you're in an abyss, but also giving you a lot of freedom too. So mm -hmm. it worked out well for me. So I would say that that relationship at that point was hugely beneficial for me. And I, I ended up doing, I mean, I took community classes at our community college classes, which are much more structured and there's a syllabus and, and I did, um, you know, workshops with people that were really focused on hyper realism. And so since then I've kind of tried different things, but I would say there was just something about those workshops at that time that was pivotal for me. And then you and I did a workshop together with Mike Bailey, where we were exploring the elements and principles of design, which is a lot of what I talk about on my channel here in terms of the way that lines up with just the structure of reality. Mm -hmm. But um, yes. you did a whole series of tennis shoes. <laughs> yes. That was so great. I never knew a person could do that many things with a tennis shoe. Yeah. Yeah, and, and those Mike Bailey's class, I'm so glad that you recommended it when you did. I think doing the stuff I did with Bob set me up to do something as intense as what Mike offered and, and requires, and I really got a lot out of it. And uh, yeah, we, I think I've taken that class three times now, gotten so much out of it. It's one of, one of those curricula that you can just do over and over and over again at different stages of your life and just get different things out of it. So do you want to show us um, what you've been working on in terms of uh, human portraiture? Because I, I know that Please. you, yeah, I'd love to see some more of your work. And okay. You can talk about maybe while you're showing the pictures, you can talk about where you were at in your art journey at that point and what you were learning. Maybe we Definitely. could children. Yeah. So this piece was actually um, the piece that got me the show at the Triton Museum in 2016. Um, and it was me listening to you. <laughs> you were like, you need to enter this. I was like, well, and you're like, no, you really need to. And I'm so glad I listened to you. So yeah, I entered this piece and I entered this one. And then I also entered this one. And I did, I did several of these. Um, so little side story, I work, my day job is in fundraising and I'm constantly looking at 
pictures of people in the uh, very underprivileged third world, very intense, you know, conflict ridden situations. And so I um, see a lot of these images and was getting really frustrated, you know, as, as I was spending time going to museums and going to art galleries, um, that there seemed to be a, a small handful of portraiture that was often represented and really wanting to see more uh, diversity of experiences and people and really just was drawn to some of these images and stories through my work. Um, and so a lot of the reference material that I was able to use came through some of those sources. And um, yeah. And I was really pleased that it actually made made an impact. I wasn't sure when, and that was partly why I was resistant, is I wasn't sure when I entered that that these would be the types of things that people would be interested in looking at. Um, so those were kind of, those three were sort of the initial beginnings of doing some some portraiture. The show that I ended up having, I did a few pieces. Um, the hero. Um, this is actually my brother. And so the narrative with... Story behind that. <laughs> yeah, the narrative with this one. So I titled it The Hero, just because I feel like with our culture being what it is today, we have a very one-dimensional view of the hero. And I wanted to, you know, present this idea of great internal conflict because when we tell our stories, we have the benefit of hindsight. And one of the things that I've found to be very helpful, especially actually when I read the Bible and I read about these historical stories of David and Ruth, um, is to try and see it from their perspective in that point in time with the limited knowledge that they had. And I find it much easier to relate to them because I'm not drawing on what I know to be the ending of the story, which is everything worked out great and they got to be in the Bible. And, you know, it's like people know their name for thousands of years to come. Uh, but at that time, you know, if you take anybody, Abraham, Moses, Rahab, you know, that was not their worldview. That was not their reality. They were often thinking in much smaller terms with much greater stakes because they didn't have the benefit of knowing it would work out okay. And so I really like to translate that to my own life when I'm really wrestling with anxiety and fear. Uh, it helps me connect, I think, to inspirational, wise figures. So yeah, so that's the hero. And then the skeptic. Um, this is a much more on the nose kind of painting about faith uh, and the idea of wrestling with doubt uh, and faith. And that's kind of what the two feathers represent. And they're often pitted against each other. Um, but I kind of feel like they operate more like conjoined twins and you can't have one without the other. Um, and they, they feed off of each other and they inform each other. And um, needing, I think for me, the journey has been needing to appreciate both rather than trying to eradicate doubt. She is the most amazing, I mean, just speaking artistically, the shape that she presents on the page is just an amazing shape. Thank <laughs> you. It's one of the first, you know, there's an order of seeing and the first order of seeing is the uh, value difference. And you have this wonderful, strong value contrast with the hair and the shoulders and this light pink background. But then, you know, after that comes shape, and then after that comes color. So you don't even really see the color first. You just see this very strong. So the strength of the shape, I think, tells you a lot about the strength of the person that I'm looking at. I can tell right there that she's a very strong individual. Do you, do you know her? I do. Yeah. Um, her name's Imani. She actually is 
I, well, we've lost touch. I met her through uh, a different church that I was attending at one time. We were in a Bible study. Um, and she is a wonderful model to have in the sense that she knows how to be dramatic, um, have an expressive face on camera. She's very comfortable. Um, she teaches dance, and I think she has a theater background. So I just had a bunch of props. And actually, for a lot of the show, it was like, hey, do you mind just coming over and letting me take pictures of you? And uh, so she was a wonderful model in that sense. Yeah, well, I could, I could kind of tell looking at it that you must have known her because there's so much vitality, so much personality in, in the image. Really. Thank you. And that idea of the, the two feathers representing doubt and faith, that reminds me of a lot of, I can't remember what era in art that was, but there was an era in art, you know, several hundred years ago where they, they played a lot with that symbolism idea in the sort of accoutrement that are in the picture. Okay. Yeah. And that's, it's really lovely. And then the last one I'll share from people will be this one. She um, is just remarkable. Thank you. So this one I actually did finished in June. Um, I was going to have another show, but with the world being as it is, a lot of that stuff's been put off indefinitely. Um, but I'm really glad it kind of gave me a push to finish this piece because it was also when a lot of the protests for Black Lives Matter were happening um, and it was still early enough in the pandemic that um, it was just a different psychological state for me. It's interesting to, I think we've all kind of gone through an evolution as time has elapsed with how we're coping. And so I really poured a lot of my own uh, emotional energy into this one and, and actually went through the painting process differently than I typically did. I really was trying to be as connected and open to prayer and the Holy Spirit while I was working than I think I ever have before. And it was an effortless way to work. So um, yeah, I was on a bit of a time crunch and thinking, oh, this is not going to I always create things and then look at them later and I'm like, blah, <laughs> which I know, I know a lot of creative people do, but that doesn't make it any less painful. And, uh, and I mean, I, there's things I could tweak, but I think for the most part, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with how this one came out. So how large is this painting, Stephanie? This is six feet tall and four feet wide. Six feet by four feet. Yeah. Wow. So it's a pretty big piece. Yeah, that that the imp just the impact of it on the screen here is amazing i can't i can't wait to see it in person yeah and, and the thing that i really love is the way that you've dealt with the edges here because i think i think edges have um edges are there's something important about edges in the structure of the universe <laughs> Because edges and boundaries, you know, it's kind of all the same thing. Limits, constraints, what, what's, what differentiates her from the background. And yet there's a part of the background that's coming into her a little bit, but she's still solidly holding her place. And, um, and you can see the, the push and pull between the background and the foreground. And yet you know she is contained she is constrained and limited to her her being but she's also a part of the larger world and uh, i i just think that's so beautiful and the the pathos in her eyes and the power of this image is just amazing thank you so much i love your assessment of that have you have you found that as you let's go back to let's go yeah. back screen so yeah. um no I, I mean I've definitely found that as I've matured as a person that my way of working but even just my tastes and like colors and things have changed a lot have you found that to be true for yourself as well 
Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I remember when, when I when I first started painting, I was doing little watercolors just to put on my wall so that I because I couldn't afford to buy them at the art shows, and so I would do some dumb little watercolor of a base of flowers or something, and just using very basic um, colors out of the tube, and so it was a lot of reds and yellows and blues and maybe pink you know get a little edgy and do a little pink maybe <laughs> and uh at that time we took a trip to europe and we spent three weeks in southern france and my older daughter um and her husband at the time were going to all the museums and we our our daughter our younger daughter was only five or six and she actually went with them to a couple of the museum uh, trips that they took. I had absolutely zero interest in going to museums because I thought, I'm just gonna see a bunch of stuffy old classic work and I'm really only interested in watercolor, you know, fresh, lively watercolor. That I don't know, I was so lame, I was so dumb. And so I missed out on, on all of that splendor. So like uh, maybe eight years later, we went and we spent, a week in Italy and well break, broke up a week between Paris and Italy and by that time I had grown a lot and really had an interest in going to museums and I'm just standing in front of these paintings just gobsmacked by if nothing else even if it was a painting I didn't like being able to see the brush strokes that somebody had laid on a canvas 800 years ago mm -hmm. and, and think about that person pouring out something of themselves and trying to express an idea. And by this time, I understood how hard it is to express an idea. First of all, just to think about what the idea is and then to figure out a way to convey that in an image and then to figure out a way to convey that image onto the canvas. <laughs> right. know, just, um, there's, well, there's so many factors involved in making a painting. And, um, and the odd thing that happened to me at the same time was that my taste in music went from very simple verse and chorus, three chord harmony, to now really enjoying very complex music with very atonal harmonies. And um, everything about my interests in the world just got more complex as time went on and uh, and now i love if i'm even if i'm working i typically work with a lot of color but even if i'm working with a lot of color i'll just slam some black in there <laughs> you know early on i would have never used black under any circumstances so yeah i would say my tastes have changed how oh, cool yeah. yeah yeah i think you you turned me on to art and fear the book yes which has i'm so glad that that book is like a big hug i think for neurotic artists like myself um and he talks about uh i think one of the authors was taking piano or learning piano and he told his teacher like oh i can't take what i see in my head and play it like this is driving me bananas it's so discouraging and i think anytime you're a beginner right that's biggest reason why a lot of us stay beginners in certain things because the the pain the emotional pain of trying to go through what it takes to actually not hurt your own ears or eyes is so arduous and uh the his piano teacher looked at him and said what makes you think that ever changes and this idea that you know yes we we can improve our skill and get to a point where we have recognizable skill in something but there's always going to be that gap between what we see or what we hear and what we're able to execute. And I think um, uh, Ira Glass, are you familiar with his, it went viral, I think, a couple years ago. It's called The Taste Gap, but I think you can find the interview on YouTube. Probably it's a section of an interview where he talks about similar idea that, you know, as a beginner, you, you have a sense of what's good right when you get into anything any activity sport art making of any kind you have spent a lot of time listening and appreciating and so you know it's good stuff but what you can actually create on your own is a far cry from that and so there's this long period of 
this gap between your ability and what you know to be quality. And, you know, his encouragement, of course, is to stick with it because eventually that gap does close oh, a lot that, more. I don't buy that for a minute. You don't? <laughs> well. No, because what happens is eventually you develop the skill that you need to produce the vision you had five years ago, but now your vision is five years out ahead of where you are again. Right. So your vision always outruns your skill because yeah. you're always thinking bigger thoughts. You're always you're always pushing the envelope constantly. So I don't think you ever catch up. I mean, um, you don't think it gets a little bit smaller at some point. I think what I think what happens is that you begin to um, you begin to appreciate the opportunity to chase the vision. I guess. Mm. Because, because it's in the chasing of the vision that you you determine what skills you need to develop because otherwise if you didn't have the vision out in front of you you wouldn't even know where your weaknesses are or what you need to develop and as your vision moves further ahead out in front of you all the time it's always revealing to you new areas that need work so i think this is why and i'll bring in jordan peterson I think this is why he talks about how everybody needs to have an aim. If, and if you, so that, and for him, the aim is the highest good of which you can conceive. You need to lift your eyes above the horizon and look at the highest good of which you can conceive. And it's that aim of, of looking at that, and, you know, and for us, that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're looking at that aim. And as as we look at that, we're drawn towards that, we're drawn upwards, and that upward call then comes into our field of vision, all the areas that need work, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and the areas that need work are the areas that I then can begin to work on. I can be, begin to build skills, I can begin to strive for, you know, improvement in this area or that area. But the more that I do that, the more I learn how vast the gap is between me and Christ, because Christ is continually becoming more and more exalted as I learn more about him and I understand more about his universe and how vast and amazing all this is that he created. It's not like, it's not like I'm going to get there. And I think art is the same way. You, you have a vision of what you want to say and that vision continually grows, but as it grows, you have more and more opportunity to develop new skills. So you're developing skills right now that you wouldn't have even thought about needing 10 years ago. I mean, I remember, was it when you were finishing, after you finished the, uh, the Triton Museum show, you, told me about some work that you were doing in trying to you wanted to explore more people's deeper emotions emotions that are not necessarily pretty mm -hmm. you want to find a way to explore some of the ugly painful emotions that people have on their faces and and i think that's kind of what led you to that last image you shared with us and so you were working on that you were doing a lot of large paintings exploring that but but that meant that you had to become very, very familiar with very micro changes in the way that you're dealing with the, the muscles in the face and in the way that you're dealing with the, the way the eyes crinkle up and, you know, whether mm -hmm. there's a sparkle in the eyes. And so all sorts of little mini skills that you weren't even thinking about when you were painting dogs, you know, as much yeah. as you think I want to paint the best dog in the world then you're probably thinking about how to produce lifelike hair and, and how to make a dog's eyes get that look in them that looks like the whole galaxy is residing in their eyes. Right? <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 No, it's true. It's a, it's a very different, different ball game. And actually to, to your point, there is psychological research. I don't know if you're familiar with Paul Ekman. He's actually a Bay area guy. Um, I believe he was the guy or one of the people that they consulted with, Pixar consulted with, when they made Inside Out, the mm -hmm. movie about all the different emotions. I don't know if you saw it. Yes. Oh, I've seen it twice. Yeah. Yeah. So super fun. Um, very intelligent movie, too, I feel like. And 
his his research was a big part of how they developed that. Um, and he has a, seg a section of his research called microexpressions. And this idea that there are these we, we typically experience them as flickers across someone's face. Like if you're having a conversation with them and they're, maybe their nonverbal and verbal cues are like, oh, yeah, yeah. But then maybe you see a flicker of something that's in conflict with that. And that's kind of the true emotion that they're trying to mask. Um, and so he's got like a whole online course and a lot of research and work around evaluating those micro expressions and using them to, you know, evaluate, um, you know, law enforcement, I think, uses this work quite a bit and just your own everyday social experiments. But yeah, it's it's a thing. Is he the one they made that TV series about? Maybe. I don't have TV, so I don't know. About, uh, um, a researcher in microexpressions that the FBI would always come to and they'd ask him his opinion on different... Probably. Yeah. 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 I think it only lasted one season, but it was a good show. Okay. Yeah, Paul Ekman, E-K-M-A-N. There was something else that you said that I wanted to come back to. Um, oh, basically, I'm, I'm kind of butchering the beautiful language you had around it, but the idea that the gap doesn't shrink, but you, you appreciate the journey. You become grateful to be on the journey. And I, I think about that, too, as, as a big part of growth as a person, growth as a creative the ability to look back on prior work that you've done with a little more grace and a little more compassion. And just in general, like being able to look back on our lives, look back on our 20s or, you know, whatever it is, where it was like, wow, I was such an idiot. It was so pain. It's painful to even think about, right? And you just want to denigrate it because like, oh, and I think it's, you know, maybe, maybe the challenge of maturity is to be able to be a little kinder. I don't know. Well, and the other thing about that is, and I mean, I think as a parent, you learn this too. You see your children going through very painful times and it can be very, very painful to watch that. And you think, oh, I want to fix this for them. But that's entirely the wrong approach, right? Because whoever they are going to be in the future, it, they are being built right now. And um, so all those painful, stupid times we go through when we're in our 20s. I mean, I look back, I have plenty of them, plenty of them. And yet, I believe that that's just part of the journey that I had to go through. Probably, maybe I would be a better person now if I hadn't gone through that journey. I don't know, but I wouldn't be who I am. I'd be mm -hmm. something else. I would be some other person. I wouldn't be me. Right. Me that I am, whatever of me that that I like, <laughs> part of that is that came from that time when I was doing stupid things and and when I was learning, basically, I think what happens is you learn your limits, you learn um, you learn well, I think one of the things that's kind of missing in the world today, not for everybody, but for a lot of people is the, the idea that sin exists. Um, I learned about my own sin by being a sinner. <laughs> and I mean, I'm still a sinner, but um, now I recognize it. Before I was wallowing in that without recognizing, I mean, I was filled with arrogance, thinking that I knew everything. I I have horrible memories of things that I did when I was like 20 years old. I mean, I can remember being in college and sitting in the balcony at the theater and watching other people down below. And I think I was probably sitting with my boyfriend at the time and we're just snickering about, so oh, look at so-and-so, they're so stupid or look at so-and-so, you know, mm -hmm. look at that dumb outfit they're wearing or can you believe that haircut, you know? And I just, I, I think about the arrogance that's involved in being that kind of a judgmental, critical, nasty human being. Mm -hmm. I just want to crawl in a hole, you know? And yet, because that happened, I can see in myself that that potential is there and that because of that, I need Jesus Christ to change me and to transform me. If I didn't see that potential as being there, I would probably think, man, I'm okay. 
I'm not mm -hmm. as bad as that guy over there, you know, I'm okay. <laughs> so, um, I, I, yeah, I think we have to have those memories. They're part of what builds us as to who we are. But as to your paintings that you've done in the past that you look at and with kind of a side eye, what you have to remember is that they are bringing great joy to others because others are seeing something in there that you are not seeing because your paintings are not just what you're putting in there. Your paintings are you and whatever the Lord is putting in there for other people to see because people do see something that we don't see. I mean, I've seen that all the time. I'll paint something and I'll look at it and I'll think, what on earth is that? And somebody else will come along and they'll say, oh my gosh, I see all this in there. And I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> right. I used to try to tell people what my paintings were. And now I just say, why don't you tell me what you see? <laughs> a lot of wisdom in that. No, I think that's, that's a wonderful reminder. Thank you. Because very easily I can make my creative work about myself. And that's, I think, probably, probably been the biggest struggle of my creative life is that I get far too wrapped up in how this represents me, in essence, my skill, my depth of thought, my, you know, artistic prowess and whatever. <laughs> and, uh, you know, how informed I am, how connected to the art world I may or may not be. And, um, or, or, you know, if you just think about it in the terms of right now, it's like the, the side hustle culture, you know, how am I, how am I growing this business or how am I, you know, putting myself out there on social media and that kind of stuff. And, um, and there's nothing wrong with any of those individual things, right? But when you put them all together in the same pot and you stew it around, it really becomes, you know, a giant pride soup. <laughs> and that's always kind of been my, my struggle is that I get too wrapped up in that stuff. And I need to just say, you know what, this isn't about you. As painful and humbling as it may be to look at something that I've created and be like, uh, I'm not really happy with this. Um, yeah, I, I think recognizing that, you know, God is able to take whatever it is that we create and make good out of it. Um, whether or not we surrender it to him is pretty impressive. <laughs> sure. Well, so you, you have a family. I do. And, and you have a job, you have a full-time job, and you have a family, and you have four dogs and a horse to take care of, yes. and you have a studio separate from your house. How do you juggle all of that? Uh, well, Karen, <laughs> <laughs> the answer is that I don't. <laughs> I constantly feel like I'm spending a lot of money in therapy trying to figure out how to, how to balance life in a way that leaves me feeling satisfied and I I would say the, the short answer is you know it's never-ending work in process but I would say you know one of the things I feel very fortunate first of all that I'm able to have such a full life and I think spending time with gratitude is important when we feel overwhelmed by all the things pulling on us uh, it's a good reframe um, and then I've, I've started to embrace the idea that I work in cycles and that, you know, the seasonality of life, right? We hear a lot about this in church, but I've, I've never really embraced it, I think, on a personal level until this year. And this idea that my, I have quite a few preoccupations about how my life is supposed to look, you know, and I like schedules and I like to-do lists and I like productivity and I could spend hours like binge watching some of these productivity guys on YouTube. Um, apps and spreadsheets and stuff. And so I have a really clear idea of what my life should like or what, what, I, what it should look like or what I would like it to look like. And then there's kind of how I end up behaving. And I'm always trying to kind of cram myself into a more acceptable version, I guess, that, that fits what I believe would create the end results that I want. And, um, you know, nothing wrong with habit change, nothing wrong with you know, learning new, new tools and, and skills. But I also think maybe the less talked about part of that is embracing kind of who you are and working with that energy. And so I've really 
tried to let go of feeling like, oh, I have to do this every day or every week in order to qualify as a painter or a creative person. And instead kind of going, well, if I look historically at my track record, I do my best work when I've got a clear deadline, I've got, um, you know, a certain amount of vision, not, not overkill, not over planning it. Uh, and then, you know, just uh, some stretches of time where I just kind of binge on it. I'm kind of a binger <laughs> that way. And so I think just letting myself do that and be okay with it instead of kind of always beating myself up that it needs to happen more frequently or for a certain amount of time has been really helpful. And so my studio spaces end up becoming a multi-purpose space where there's times where it's really set up for painting and then there's times where it's really set up for other things. Um, I enjoy doing a little bit of sculpture. Um, sometimes I'll have other home projects that I'm, you know, I have power tools that I like working on. Um, I've been toying with the YouTube idea, you know, so yeah, I would say that's, that's kind of how I quote unquote do it all is that I allow for seasons and stretches and, and binges and rather than trying to conform to a more regular schedule I just kind of go you know what this is where my energy is this is where my passion is right now and I can work my life around sprinting in that direction for a little while and then for whatever reason things will change and I'll sprint in another direction and it's not the most organized way to work but it kind of seems to be what I've settled into at this point <laughs> Well, I don't think artists are known for being organized. <laughs> this is true. This is true, but I feel like, I don't know, this is my perception. I feel like I look, maybe this is too much social media. You know, I look on Instagram and I look at artists and galleries and it's like, oh, I would like to be in that position, right? I mean, to an extent, you have to be organized, right? There has to be consistency. Everyone talks about consistency all day long and how important it is. Yeah, yeah. I guess when you start looking at the marketing end of things, if you're going to market yourself, then you yeah. have to be that. So do you want to tell us about your podcast? Sure. Yeah, I um, started the Pet Loss Podcast back in 2017 after my dog had died. And it was uh, a really intense experience. And one that I realized even though I had lost pets over the years, different reasons, this particular loss just hit me really hard. It was a time in my life when I was having a lot of change and change and transition. I was getting married. I was taking on, um, you know, two stepdaughters and people moving in. And, um, and so it was, it was a really lonely experience and a really painful one. And I found that by connecting with other people, which as an introvert, when I hear other people talking about connecting to other people, I'm like, Ugh. but I will say that there was tremendous value in at least knowing that I wasn't alone in my experience. And that's kind of really more what I try to encourage people toward, whether that's finding content online or actually meeting socially distanced <laughs> in person. There's something that we're built for in terms of connecting in some way that way and knowing we're not alone. And so pet loss just happened to be a subject that I realized there wasn't a lot of conversation, at least from what I found, and there was a lot of need. And so um, I started it, and there's some interviews posted up right now, and just some thoughts of me sharing what helped me get through that space. Um, and then I have since decided in the recent weeks that I... I'm looking at moving it to YouTube and actually having the content. It makes it a little more discoverable, I think, um, and just wanting to experiment with video. So it'll be renamed The Pet Loss Show, um, and that that'll, that'll be hopefully going live here in the next week or two. So, so that's been... Do you, do you talk, do you do like a uh, live stream where people ask questions or are you interviewing people or what what are you doing on the podcast so the the initial set of videos will be around um grief specific grief topics um so coping strategies um a, a lot of it too i think is 
letting people know that they're not alone in terms of these are commonalities that a lot of us that are grieving pets go through um, because that was really helpful for me to hear. Um, So there'll be eventually, yeah, interviews um, and I would love to do live streams. There's a lot of technical knowledge that I'm in the process of acquiring in order to be able to do all that stuff. Um, So yes, long-term plan will be to be able to do, I'd like to have like a weekly live stream and, you know, be able to do Zooms and stuff like this that I can post as well. So live stream is pretty easy on YouTube, I think. Yeah, I think it probably is. I, I don't know, but I sometimes see this little button. If you want it to be live stream, you push this button when you publish. <laughs> okay. All right. Good to know. I don't know. And there's another thing you can do where you can, you can publish it at a um, certain time. It's what they call a, a premiere. And so you can be there. Um, pu- you can publish it and you can be there at the same time that people are starting to watch it. You can pr- announce it ahead of time. There's going to be a premiere at such and such time. Okay. People can interact with you while it's playing. Okay. So live chat. I mean, yeah. You can do on YouTube that I don't know if you can do on podcasts. So. Okay. Yeah. I've seen, I've been in a couple of those in my feed where I've clicked on them and I'm like, wow, this is so cool. This is. Yeah. I don't think it's a lot of technical expertise. I think YouTube has pretty much done everything. Okay. It's just Sweet. exploring once you get your YouTube channel set up. Yeah. So if you can give me a link to the, to the pet loss podcast. Um, and I will look up links to these other things that you've mentioned so we can put them in the show notes so that people can explore further if they want to. That would be great. Yeah. Hopefully there was some value for other folks in our conversation today. So I love talking to you. So I could do this anytime you want. <laughs> A lot of value for me. Yeah. I would love to have you on again sometime. Um, especially if um as as you move ahead on this series that you're working on it would be now you said that that your your triton you know your triton museum solo show got postponed but is it canceled or just postponed indefinitely they yeah they're not sure it wasn't officially canceled it was more like we're basically looking at 2022 based on the resources that we've had and the backlog that they're going to need to get through and I don't even know that they're open again and at what pace so yeah so at this point I'm holding that out into the future and just working kind of on my own on the stuff to see what comes out so you have a theme for that show was it mainly going to be emotional micro I don't have a yeah I don't have a title um but yeah it's delving more into that micro expression stuff for sure yeah well it's going to be really exciting to see what you do in the future yeah a privilege to know you and wow. Stop. I I feel so honored that you even asked to have me on. So thank you. Um, and I miss you. And I we and we talked about before we started recording, recording, hanging out. So let's definitely make that happen because yeah, I know, value your friendship so much. And I've been thinking it would be kind of fun, maybe for the viewers who make it all the way to the end of the video. I'll say this now because you know I think the typical <laughs> watch time on my videos is 16.4 minutes or something like that. So not everybody okay. makes it way to the end, but if they did, sure. I would like to see some comments in the comment section on if people would like to have a live Zoom where a bunch of viewers could just get on and we could all talk to each other. We wouldn't even have to record it. It would just be an opportunity to get to meet some of the viewers. And um, I think that would be Definitely. Fun. Yes, that would be amazing. Her who is from London and uh, she had made a lot of comments in the comment section and we got talking in the comments. And so I started having zoom calls with her in London just for fun and, you know, get to meet people from all over. So that's awesome. Yeah. See all the fascinating work that comes out of what God can do with our creative passions. 
Yes. I That's never so cool. What God can do. And, uh, yeah. and you're one of the great blessings in my life that God brought into my life. So thank you, Stephanie. Hugs. I'm giving you a hug right now. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great love you so much. And give my best to Ryan and the girls and, uh, and hug your dogs for me. And I will. Thank you. And to your family as well. Miss you lots. Love you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye. Thank you.